I just felt like he had suffered so much, uh, you know, and, and people with extreme mental illness do really suffer a lot. Uh, and, you know, my first reaction, like when I found him uh, dead, um, was, uh, uh, you know, I, I was just in a vortex of, uh, I don't know, of shock and sadness, but it didn't take me very long. And I don't know if it was a half an hour or an hour or 15 minutes or 20 minutes when I thought, of course, of course you did that. I don't blame you a bit. I was proud of the way he survived, I guess. For as long as he did. For as long as he did. We sent Louis to, to Cam H in Toronto, and uh, I, you know it's supposed to be the best place in the world or one of the best places for OCD, mm. and it just was a disaster. I don't so know you why. got him on a plane to go up to. Uh, Mary then went with him, and, and she flew up to Toronto with him, and and stayed with her friend, and then the next day he went into the into that thing, and, and the Newfoundland helped, and they, you know, MCP paid for the uh, not for the trip, but they paid for the uh, the medica you know, the stuff in the hospital, yeah. and. Uh, uh, I don't know what happened there. It seemed I haven't gotten those records because I can't get them from Ontario for some reason because I need to have to, you know more things. But anyway, uh, um, when he came back from that, he got. They took him off all his medication, which was really strange. They took him off lithium. They took him off everything but cold turkey, and uh, which seemed like a very strange idea to me. Uh, although, you know, when someone says that to you as a parent, they said, we have we see no evidence of bipolar. And so you go... It's heavily medicated. <laughs> How would he show symptoms? Or whatever, or maybe. But, but, but as a parent, you think, oh, this is a hopeful thing. And then actually for a couple of days, Louis was kind of really, you know, it, it, it's most clear. But then he just began to crumble, <laughs> you know. Um, and he came home, went to the... And then about two weeks after he came home, he went right to the health sciences, you know. Let's just put him on what he was on when he left the mental hospital or, or, or when he went to Ontario first because that seems to be the thing that works the best. And, it works uh, best. It works best. Uh, wow. and, and Louis was happy with that. And, and, and Louis was not a person who uh, was uh, uh, cynical about drugs. He, he hoped, always hoped, that, be something that, that something would, would make him feel better. He was never like, you know, uh, in that world of thinking there's nothing wrong with me. He didn't have that particular problem. He was hoping there'd be some relief. Always hoping. And yeah. if you go to that door that many times for relief and it doesn't work, yeah, it's got to be exhausting. Then he, then finally, I think that in 2014 when he died, he was, uh, uh, he had given up on that. In fact, one of the last things that happened was that they found, you know, the doctor they, they were taking back non-use pills, the Act Theme, mm -hmm. and he had only taken uh, less than half his medication for the previous month. You know, and then so then then we all said, well, maybe he should change his medication. So they changed his medication, and then he he killed himself. But um, looking back at the records now, he had talked about that a lot. In fact, he had said pretty clearly how he was thinking of doing it, and they didn't say that to us. And I know that. They're not allowed because he was 20 years old. He was 20, actually, he was 28 at this point, so he was like 26, 27, 28. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he had said it to me. In fact, in fact, when I got him in in 2011, it was because he had said that to me. 
And then again in 2012, in the fall, you know, he said it to me, you know, that he was thinking about he wanted to commit suicide. And, he had some, I, and so I, I immediately rushed and went right and said, guys, you need to do something about this. And they got him in hospital. Mm -hmm. But that's the only thing that's on my mind now from all the research I've been doing is it wasn't clear enough to me that his suicide ideation and, you know, in specific plans for suicide were so clear in 2012. Two years before he died. Two years before he died. And, and then even when I go back to 2003, six, when he first went in the hospital, I didn't realize he had said it so many times. So I started putting a yellow mark on those records whenever I said there's a lot of yellow marks there. So that, that's the that's the only thing that you know. And then I realized, you know, oh yeah, it says his father said this and was bringing him to hospital. So why wasn't I more aware of it or something? Was that during inpatient treatment that he was talking about specific planes? Uh, he was talking. He, he was during inpatient treatment, okay. and so sometimes they were, technically they were watching him in the hospital. Oh yeah, yeah, they were. Okay. And, and and you know, this may be too much of a detail, but. We had always had an agreement with Louis that we could talk about anything, like so. And I can see, I can say, maybe ten times or maybe eight times, the doctor would say, "Is this okay, Louis? Are you okay with your parents, you know, talking about this in conversation?" Right. So I kind of thought they would have told you that he had been talking that about that based on that. Claim. Although I can't find any consent forms that said that. But you could have signed them. There could have been. They could have given those to you, so you could talk about it. I don't know. If you I, go I to a know. psychologist and say that you're going to hurt yourself. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. They'll, they have to report that. Or if you say you're going to hurt somebody else, they have to report that. There are ways to, Yes. somebody has a specific plan in mind. Yes, and I found those forms, a couple of those where it says, you know, and, and the nurse just says, I explained to him the, whatever that's called, where you right. say, you realize if you are going to hurt yourself or hurt somebody else, yes. I'm allowed to report it. Right. So I'm a bit confused by that. And that's something I just, I'm yeah. just beginning to, you know, yeah, you know. And if it had been one, I understand like you can look back and you can't pinpoint mistakes and things like that, but when it's a consistent thing throughout the records, that would be uh, pretty hard to swallow. I, I, I think they don't seem to result in any action. But these are very, very deeply ingrained things in our system where every day, three times a day, a nurse will write down everything that someone said, you know, not everything, but, you know, a, yeah. a summary of what they said yeah. that day. And there's some incredible details in there. And, uh, you know, they're really heartbreaking to read. Is there one, is there any person overseeing all the notes? Like, what is, do you know the purpose of the notes? Is it illegal to cover themselves? Or is it, does someone oversee and say, we're looking back through his chart over the last three years. Yeah, I, I think, I think there's some sense that the psychiatrists, uh, when I read their letters and their their summaries, you know, again, if you had a psychiatrist sitting next to me, they might explain how this works. <laughs> but it seems that they do do a kind of a, they, you know, and they they summarize kind of what was happening to him in the hospital, and they have those those letters there that are typed actually, so they're easy to read. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is some sense of it, but I guess no one knows what to do. Like, what are you going to do with someone? I, I don't know what you do. I, I, I guess the, it's just like if someone said you were having this kind of heart trouble, they'd say, well, let's send him to the guy that puts stents in hearts. or that gives you open heart surgery. And, and unfortunately, we think that that's the same world. We think, oh, there's a, men for there's example, a medical model, there's a medical model that, that, that's sort of like that. Um, and, uh, you know, but as, as Robert Whitaker says, and people are saying now, is that the idea of chemical imbalance is complete myth. And so we thought, oh, diabetes. Pancreas doesn't produce insulin. We'll fix it's a chemical. We'll fix chemical. Let's put a chemical into you. And so they, they use it. Someone said that that was, that was coined as a, as a metaphor in the early days, and it's stuck, and people can't get over it. Right. And so they think, oh, pump them with all this, and we'll keep trying the right cocktail of, yeah. of, of chemicals yeah. to make the chemicals go back to something. And that's There's some not... equilibrium point, and it just um, doesn't exist. And it's different for everybody, I would imagine, too. And what I gather from uh, Robert Whitaker, too, is that the number of tests that you need to do 
and this, th someone can correct me if this is not right, but for example, what I gathered from, not necessarily from Robert Whitaker, from other sources, is if you do 12 tests and uh, 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 seven of them don't prove it, if you have three that do prove it, the, F the FDA and the states will approve the drug. Now, I don't know if that's just folklore or whatever, but... <laughs> That sounds you know, right. But, you know, that's, that's a very frightening thing. Yeah. And that, that, somehow, that somehow people are losing faith in science. In my mind, that, you know, we came in the 50s and for, after the war and stuff like that, our generation had a great deep belief in science as being something that was reliable, uh, reliable and that was independent, you know, even though there's lots of problems even within that. Yeah. But, and I think that people don't trust science anymore, and it may be because they've been bought by, uh, by big science corporations. Science has let us down a lot, too. Has let us down, you know. But, but, but then again... It's not really science if it's a study that's been bought by a corporation. Exactly. Yeah, you, you, you've got to, you know... There's no real research. Yeah, except that, of course, in the other, uh, in the medical, physical medical world, you know, there's just unbelievable progress. What they can make now with, I mean, like, you know, I mean, people, everybody kind of died of cancer one time, and now, you know, I mean, how many people do I know who have survived cancer? So, so we're thinking it's the same thing, and it just isn't. It's treated very differently. Yeah. And it's, um, it's almost like they don't know, well, we don't know where it's coming from, so let's just make the, the most, per, most troublesome presenting symptom, let's make that go away, and we'll consider that a success. We have somebody That's like Lou yeah, who's yeah. sitting in his apartment and is just in so much pain, and maybe he's not causing trouble. Maybe he's not kicking in the principal, something in the principal's office, but he's still in a lot of pain. And for the family, watching that happen, that's a lot. That's a that that affects the whole family. It's not just one person. It affects the whole family, and then the people around you guys. So, in all the research that you're doing, how does that help with grief? Uh, I uh, I don't know. Uh, it is really tough to read that, and it's taken me, you know, most of a year to get to the point where I can read it. Mm -hmm. um, and now I can sort of read it a little bit. I'm not so, um, you know, taken, uh, you know, with grief. I went to Banff for a month to work on this material. I brought all of Louis's records with me, big suitcase full of records. And I ended up this was almost, it was over four years since he had died, mm. but actually I spent that month re-grieving. So I had a whole month of, and I, I, you know, that was such a session of, of grieving and crying, and, and I was by myself, and it was actually very lonely out there. Um, um, and luckily they have a psychologist on staff, it was a wonderful psychologist, she helped me a lot. Um, but, uh, I don't know. It's very difficult to explain uh, why um, uh, you, uh, what you feel. It's, you know, that there's, there's no mitigation. Uh, maybe, maybe you don't think about it as much. That's maybe the only thing. When I think about it, and I think about it, you know, a lot, uh, um, it seems like it's as intense as ever. But maybe the difference is with time is you don't think of it so many times a day. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> hmm. That's a good way to describe it. I guess. Yeah, you know yourself. Uh, uh, you know, it just takes... You know, because the event is the event. And that is the reality of the world. And it's the reality of it's your reality. It's my reality. It's everyone's reality. And how can, you know... And when it's your child, it, it just, you know, it, it's extremely intense. And, you know, I think about, I always think about people from, every time I feel sorry for myself, which I often, often do, believe me, I feel, um, I think about people in the Holocaust who lost everyone. Children, brothers, sisters, yeah. fathers, mothers. And they, most of them carried on. I don't think very many of them did suicide. Well, they might not have had multiple, multiple grief to deal with. They might have just been surviving. 
So that's hard to even, because that, that's the Catholic model of someone's got it worse than you, though. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I understand <laughs> you know? that. And it doesn't matter, like, you know, like, you know, like if I got to, if you nail my foot to the floor, I, I mean, there might be people, you know, who are much worse off than I am, but I got to get that nail out that my nail foot. Out. Yeah, exactly. You know, but, and uh, there are definitely worse things. There, there are things that people have had multiple losses, multiple things, but that doesn't take away the magnitude of what you feel. And no. That's uh, that's something that in people that I've talked to who have lost children, yeah, it never goes away. That feeling maybe they don't think about it like you said as often, but the feeling is like it happened yesterday or it just happened. Yes, that's or that's something that you carry. Or I still go, did that happen? It's almost did like our it boy to else? take his own life. Yeah. Did that happen to that little boy, our little boy, who we loved and was like, you know, full of, you know, we're full of fun, and we were just, you know, being ridiculous and having, you know, and, uh, you know, just, I don't know, it's like that, whatever that love you have for your children is, is, is there's nothing like it in the world. So, uh, you know, and, uh, but so I guess I'm still in that, did that happen? I even said to my other I was like, I can't believe this happened. I think it's hard when you get up the next morning and you go to the grocery store and your bank card bounce, like your ATM card doesn't work. And it's like, how can this possibly, how did, like all these people are buying their groceries. That guy probably has a problem. He's probably got a pain in his foot. And life keeps going on and this tragedy has happened. And it's almost like, am I in a different reality? Did this actually happen? Because nobody else seems to notice that this happened. And it would make you question your your sanity, really, because yeah. you're in this vortex, and other people are just carrying on like it never happened. Now maybe their vortex was yesterday, or the next it hasn't yeah, even happened yeah. to them yet. But I guarantee, if they're a human being, they will suffer. Absolutely, and they will suffer tra tragedy in their lives. Yeah. And some, I guess the odd person must escape, but I, I don't know very many. It's hard to it's hard to feel empathy for everybody that's going through stuff for sure. It, it I think losing a child opens you up to that, that you have some empathy, and then there's a there's a cap to how much you can feel because eventually you're like, this was really shitty. What happened to me too? Yes. And that's another thing that it, did it happen to you or was Louis in so much pain and now he's not in pain anymore? Did it happen to me or did it happen to Louis? That's the good thing. So when I feel sorry for myself, I think it happened to me. Right. When I, when I, when I, when I'm more in touch with reality, I think it happened to Louis. Right. He was the one who experienced the tragedy here, not me. He's, right. his life was cut. Basically when he was 13, yep. his life was started going. He just started destroyed in a way. Right. It was beginning to be destroyed. Right. You know, I mean, you know, like, you know, he had lots of good times too. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, like even after that, he had good times. And, and I, I, uh, I make sure you get that in there. You know, like he had girlfriends, he had lovers, and, and I hear stories about him and stuff like that. Right. And apparently, <laughs> I came home one time, and this girl told another woman I work with that that I had come home and came, you know, I was just trying to get in the bathroom, and he he was in the shower with this girl. So I thought, okay, so he what had a some. Moment. He had a great. I, I'm glad he had fun and. and uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, and he did lots of stuff, and he was uh, still doing stuff. You know, so, so it's so funny with mental illness like that too. Sometimes because people, you know, really are totally rounded people in many ways. It's something that they're, you know, they're, they're they're stricken with this one thing, but you know, so he had all this still operating. Right. He wasn't brain damaged, like you know. He he wasn't. He didn't have part of his brain removed in an accident or something. Right. He was. Uh, All the parts were still working, which was probably maybe if some of them could work a little bit less. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah, some people, things were over. So he did have good times, and even you know, not those last few years. I don't think he had very many good times. The last, I would just say off the top of my head, from uh, look at my list of days, 2010 to 2014. You know, I'd say then, you know, those last four years were, I don't think he had a lot of fun, although he had the odd time, but the sad thing about humans is it seems like, you know, it has to happen to you before you really, right. you know. And before it happens, you don't think it can happen to you. No. <laughs> more, I mean, I think we're a little more complex than that, but, but basically that seems like it. I don't think I ever felt that. You, you know, one thing, um, like it's just like an example is uh, that uh, I never understood people whose kids were out of control in school. And I th think I blamed to. them. You know, I think I had that in me, uh, you know, to think, oh, it's the parents' fault mm. until you suddenly have a child yourself. You know, and, and teachers say stuff. Like teachers said to me, uh, uh, vice principal said, sure, I'm driving by in the morning. I could pick them up. 
as if we weren't paying well, We didn't think of driving him to school. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, I said, look, you know, this is not the problem, man. Like, we're standing by, you know, ready to drive him anywhere, drive him, best. you know, to the moon if he had to. But, and, and someone said to me also <laughs> that, I hope you say the names, but he said, Yes, he said, I know that this other artist's son also had problems. So, so you're, sort of, you're sort of saying, like, because we're bohemian artists, we can't control our kids. And, and, you know, and, of course, you have to believe that. You have to believe that something, that it's something to do with your efforts. And if your children are really great and they're doing well, then... Because you did great. It's because you did great. Yeah. And, of course, when you don't have that in your life you think I don't agree with that theory at all because you know my son had so much difficulty uh, and, and I you know and it may have been our fault who knows so Andy since you've lost Louis um, I understand I've heard some stories around town that when somebody in the, in the community loses somebody to suicide that you guys have reached out to sometimes total strangers uh, a few times, yes, and sometimes people reach out to us, mm -hmm. and lots of people with, with, you know, many people come to our house and they're having, you know, uh, difficulties with their children and stuff, and, and usually there's almost nothing we can say except, you know, to give them comfort. <coughs> um, but, uh, yes, you know, it's like you can be a little bit comforting to people who have just joined this horrible club that you're in. Um, uh, and but it has not been overwhelming at all you know I know some people who are you know have heard that story that they just get overwhelmed by um, especially if they have high profile and dealing with it but we haven't ever been overwhelmed by it at all and we have been able to I don't know what you can give people I'm not sure it's comfort but you just be there to listen to them I guess well you mentioned how lonely it was out in Banff so just to be able to talk to somebody who's been through the same experience must be a huge comfort. Did you guys have anybody that was comfort for you? Yes. Okay. So that seems to have impacted. Did that impact how you guys have treated other families? Yeah. It's a tough club to be in. No, we had. Uh, <laughs> I got to say, we had uh, we had great support. You know our families, our friends. People in the arts community uh, were extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Faith in human nature, afterwards, you know, uh, and, uh, but I think as I get further away from those events, I get, uh, I feel some hardening, you know, I, I, I'm not as soft as I was for those first few years. I, I hate it's to say raw. that. It's wrong. At first, it's very raw, yeah. I would imagine. And you're just reaching out, and, you know, it's not like you're drowning, drowning or something, and yeah. you just are holding on to people who are holding you up, you know, and I hope, I, I, I wish I could keep that um, empathy uh, alive as, as much as possible. But you probably have to keep the drowning feeling, too. Yeah, you and do. You don't uh, want it to be raw forever. No, no, and I, and I want, you know, and of course, you know, the other day I went to see uh, uh, a counselor who was mm -hmm. actually a, a yoga uh, yep. person, and, and she's yep. really good, and and uh, she, she uh, actually did something that no one else has done, uh, although I saw a great, great grief counselor for many years after Louis died, uh, uh, but this woman uh, got me to talk to Louis. She said, okay, what would you say to him? And, and, she, and she said, it's, and you'd say it. And then she said, and then she said, what would Louis say to you? And, uh, you know, I, I, I can always hear Louis saying, you know, relax, Dad. You know, carry on with your life. The, the last thing he wanted was for us to suffer. You know, that's why he didn't do it for so many years. He put it off. When I look at those r medical records, he was saying from 2003 to 2014. That's how many years? That's nine years. And it may even be even you before. Think he that. wanted to. I think he talked about suicide in 2003 in that first admission to the hospital, yeah. a lot. And uh, right through all, every time he was 200. I added up the other day. He was 204 days in either the health sciences uh, psychiatric uh, uh, acute psychiatric ward or in uh, the, at the Waterford. So uh, uh, you know during that time um, he. Uh, he talked about suicide so much.
you know, when, when I used Louis's voice to speak to me, you know, he was saying to me, which I think is, you know, I've obviously known, is that he, the last thing he wanted was to make us feel bad. That's why I think he didn't commit suicide earlier. I think he tried everything not to do it because he didn't want to because he knew what it would do to us. And then it just became too much for him. And so he, uh, uh, he did it. But I think, uh, you know, so I think that's what Louis would, uh, would say to me. Like, I could hear him saying it to me, don't, don't do it. And, and the other thing about Louis, just by the way, uh, which has nothing to do with any other person probably, but Louis had a, this thing that, uh, that there's a Hebrew word for it, and it's called thirgun. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's how it's pronounced. It's a Hebrew word, and I think it's a modern Hebrew word. But it means genuine joy at other people's success. And it's something I don't have, you know, like I'm definitely jealous of other people's success, uh, you know, you know, <laughs> all the time. You know, I, I can't look at, I can't look at Facebook at all. I get always, I've always had that problem. So he didn't get that from me, but he got that even when he was a little boy and, you know, and our neighbor kids would do well at something and they, yeah. you know, he would say, you know, he was so, so proud of his friend who was so smart in school and he was so proud of Martha. And even though I know he was deeply affected by the fact that he couldn't see his own dreams fulfilled, you know, uh, his dreams of, you know, of just having a normal life and having kids and all of which he wanted to do. He never lost that pride and happiness. You know, it's like uh, they talk about schadenfreude, which is the opposite, which is uh, joy at someone's misery. misery. Yeah. And so it's this fear gun, it seems to be the opposite of that. And he had that. So I would imagine not that anyone who committed suicide wouldn't want their parents to do well afterwards. He had that in spades. You are able to help other people by telling, by telling your story and by telling what happened to Louis. You're taking some of people's pain away. That's a pretty spectacular um, legacy to leave behind. Well, I don't know if I've ever taken anybody's pain away, but for other families that are going through it and don't know what to do with that guilt and shame and all the other crap that goes along with it, you're, you're taking, you're yeah, easing people's, yeah. you know, burden. Yes, yeah, you know, I was trying to, I mean, I keep telling myself that not to feel guilty and, you know, and I, gosh, I spend so much time going like, well, what if I'd done this, what if I'd done that? And, and I, I, sometimes I think that that's accurate. I could have done more, uh, you know, uh, maybe I, I should have done more. and. Uh, Sometimes you don't do more because, you know, for the strangest reasons, you think, oh, I'm working, I'm trying too hard with this. And the doctor said, when, when he went to Cam H in Toronto, the psychiatrist said, quite rightly, he said, I think, you know, I don't think you're going to be happy, Andy, until you make this happen. You know, and it's you true. Take your son's pain away after, of course. Well, well <laughs> yeah, I know, but, but, but it's like, you know, and what he was sort of saying was, there's nothing better that can happen in Ontario than probably can happen here. Mm. And actually, it turned out that in some ways he, he was right, you know. Andy, again, I'm absolutely honored to speak with you about Louie, and thank you so much for sharing your story so openly, and I really appreciate you talking to us. Well, thank you for doing this series. It's, it's you know, another little facet of everything getting dug at. Tiny step forward, right? <laughs> Thanks so much, Andy.